We really break it down into two different types of categories. The standard battery, it's been around for 150 years, and then the newer lithium, okay? And what I'm gonna do is talk about the benefits of both. And based on your uh, RV expectation, it'll help you choose on which one you wanna go with. So what I wanna do is do some comparisons between, now when I say you know, lead-acid battery, I'm also talking about gel and AGM because those are the same chemistry. Now, those batteries have been around for, like I said, about 150 years, and they've done a wonderful job. They've done a wonderful job for what we're doing. However, technology is increasing, and what we're able to do now uh, with inverters is take battery power to run things like our air conditioners, our residential-style refrigerators, all the comforts of home, okay? And the question is, can the standard battery that's been around uh, for 150 years, can it do that? I'm gonna go ahead and answer that. The answer is no. That's not what that battery was designed to do. So what I wanna do is do some comparisons uh, when we're talking about batteries. Now, bar batteries are nothing more than stored energy, right? We charge and discharge them. Well, that's, we take the energy out of it, we put the energy back in. Okay, but lead acid batteries uh, is a chemical reaction to change that potential energy into electrical energy. And that chemical um, interaction takes time. And because it takes time, we can't take all the energy out of that battery too fast, nor can we put it back in. I will change the wording for this. And what I'm talking about is the charge and discharge rates of batteries. Okay, now standard battery, if you're just running your lights, you know, all the 12 volt demands, a lead acid battery is absolutely perfect. It, stu it has stood the test of time, it does everything that it needs, but it does it at a very slow pace. So let's just look at our charge profile or the speed at which we can charge a lead acid battery. On average, if you take a lead acid battery that is completely discharged, now when I say completely discharged, I mean right below 12 volts. I'm not talking zero volts, but right below 12 volts. It will take anywhere from eight to 16 hours to completely charge that back up. If you've noticed with your converter, if you've ever done any research into your battery charger, there's multiple stages. There's what we call our uh, bulk. This is where the battery is just being charged at a high rate. And then as the battery is being charged, we then slow down the amperage into the battery. We call that an absorption. And then finally float. The first eight hours, is the bulk and absorption stage, okay? Let, let, let acid battery, the first eight hours is the bulk and absorption stage if the battery is dead. The next seven to 10 hours, the next seven to 10 hours, that is just gonna top off the last 30% of a battery. So that means, you know, it takes up to 16 hours to charge that battery if you completely use it all up. Now again, batteries are stored energy. If you are going to be plugged into shore power all the time, you also have in the RV what's called a converter. Converter is going to do a lot of the work. If you're always going to be plugged into shore power, then the speed at which that battery being charged isn't that big of a deal to you. You just want to make sure there's enough power there to get your landing gear down, your slides out so you can plug into shore power, run some lights or something like that. But again, as long as you're plugged into shore power, the battery is not doing the work, the converter is. Okay, so if that's the um, uh, type of RVing you want to do, you always go to resorts or whatnot, and you're beginning to wonder, do I need to switch my batteries out? Probably not. If I compare it to a lithium battery, now lithium battery is a different chemistry altogether, different chemistry altogether. Now it's not the first time we've actually changed the chemistry. We've been through about four or five different variations and finally landed on lithium. The speed at which I can pull that potential energy out of that battery one to three hours, depending on the size of the battery. So if I have the same size battery side by side, the speed at which I can, sorry, charge it, charge it is one to three hours, okay? So when would you want to charge those up that fast? Well, that's when you're not connected to shore power. When you're not connected to shore power, going off grid, what we call off grid, taking your RV to places where there's not an RV park, okay? That's where this begins to start making sense. So the first thing I wanna say between the two, lead acid gel and AGM versus lithium, the speed at which they can be charged. The same is true uh, for the speed at which they become discharged. 
Again, a battery, I've got potential energy in there. How quickly can I discharge it? How quickly can I discharge it? Now, I wrote up here for best results, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, if your battery has some type of warranty, three to 500 cycles, right? They have different discharge rates, but for the, you know, to, to uh, I guess, stick with your warranty, what they will say is don't discharge it too fast. So when they run the test with your lead acid battery, they will hook up a light, five amps, and they will discharge that battery, and they'll see how long it lasts, and that will determine how many, quote, amp hours you have. Typically in my class, I liken batteries um, to marathon runners and sprinters. Batteries, the type that we use in the RV, right, for our deep cycle batteries, they are like a marathon runner. What do I mean by that? That marathon runner trains to run a very long distance, but at a slightly slower pace. Crock pot versus an instant pot, right? So your lead acid battery, deep cycle battery, is more like a crock pot. It takes time to pull that energy out. If we try and pull it out too fast, there's a chemical reaction that takes place too fast and the walls begin to swell. We use a term, we call it boiling the battery. If you charge a battery too fast, discharge a battery too fast, chemical reaction takes place too much and we're actually separating the water that's inside. So you get a lot of air pressure inside. That's what makes them swell. Well, when they swell, now you've actually really lowered the time frame that, that battery's gonna last, right? So understand that with a lead acid battery, it is like a crock pot. It does deliver the power and it can run small things nearly all day long, right? If you're looking for performance, and again, running more things, you know, we now have 12 volt style refrigerators, we have your furnace, there's several things in there, and the more items you turn on, the greater the demand you're pulling from that battery. And if you're not plugged into shore power, then you need a battery that can basically discharge or be built like a sprinter, right? Hard and fast out of the blocks can run as fast as possible. That's what we're looking at, lithium. Okay, now lithium, again, the standard discharge rate, or standard discharge rate, one to three hours. I can completely charge that battery up, discharge the entire battery in one hour and not have a problem with it. Charge it right back up will not hurt a thing. Now, both of those, I can discharge them faster for a smaller amount of time, right? If I asked you guys to sprint, right? There's a certain amount of steps you can sprint, but you can't sprint near as far as you can run and you can't run near as far as you can jog. All batteries, if we're pulling up just a light load off of them, they're going to be able to go a very long distance, okay? Some batteries designed to go in a sprint pace at a lot longer distance than the other batteries. And that's really what we're looking at here. The discharge rate of a lead acid battery versus lithium. And again, why would you do that? You know, and it all depends on how you RV. Again, if you are connected to shore power, you're not running a lot of 12 volt items. There's absolutely no reason to switch from a lead acid battery. It's been around forever and it's doing the job for you. But again, if you desire to be off-grid just a little bit, and if you could take that quiet power with you to run larger items, then you need to consider switching over to a, a lithium battery. So again, if this is your RVing dream, right, being in a, a resort of some sort, an RV park of some sort, and you're plugged into shore power, stick with that lead acid gel or AGM battery. It's really probably not worth the money that you're gonna spend and getting it back, right? Now, I will tell you that a lithium battery will do the same thing as a lead acid battery and actually run a little bit better. But again, if you're connected to shore power, that converter is on and it's doing most of the work. The battery becomes the backup. So RVing lifestyle, this is what you, um, now I'm not just saying here because I don't see a pool, I don't see a bar, so I don't see the reason why to stop there, right? Maybe on an overnight going to some other destination, right? Now, my wife is that way. She doesn't just go to RV parks. She goes to those parks that begin with an R where they charge you twice as much for the same site. Call them resorts. Stick a resort up there. Now it's 80 bucks a night instead of 45, right? But they have all the conveniences. If that's the case, lead acid battery is the way to go. However, and I think all of us, you know, after a, a, a time, I'm the type that I will go to all the different RV parks and there's certain ones I like. Will I go back? I don't know. There's so many other places I can go. 
right? If you could take your RV anywhere, if you could take your RV anywhere, which means now you need to, you know, have those same conveniences. What if you want to run the AC right in front of the mountains, right? Well, there are certain items that you need to have, but now we're looking for that performance battery in order to, order to able to run those larger items. So if you're at that point where you want to wake up when no one else is around, or if there's others, but you have far less limitations on where you park it, right? Keep going west, uh, BLM land, or go into harvest hosts, or whatever there is, where as long as your RV park is level, or RV is level, you can set that down, wake up, watch the sun's rise, watch the sunset without other RVs right there. Now this is where we're looking for that battery that can actually do more work. That's where we're looking at lithium. Now when lithium first came out, um, we, we had a different chemistry and there was some, there's still some concerns on those and I wanna address those. Lithium has a high potential to discharge quite a bit of energy. And when we first started putting lithium batteries together, right? There was a lot of what we well, wasn't a lot of fires. There's fires that took place. We had to learn about what was causing those fires. Now lithium, you know, is just simply mixed in with another type of metal, has a volatile reaction. Electrons just jump over from the anode rod to the cathode rod. Not a big deal there. The problem is at the rate at which they move. They move so fast because they're so free that everything begins to heat up. And if things get hot too fast, then we go into what we call thermal runaway. What does that mean for you? Well, battery's caught on fire. If you chose wrong, you didn't have an iPhone, and you chose a Samsung phone, stuck it up under your pillow, you heard about, quote, the fires that took place, right? All right, so we figured out, okay, we need something to manage that speed at which that power comes out. We need something to manage the cells so they don't get overcharged, they don't get discharged too much. So when we're looking at lithium, one of the big things that you want to make sure is, is that we put in some type of management system inside the battery to protect from that, right? Now here's where I love uh, the thought of lithium batteries. It is the first battery in 50, 150 years where we've added circuit boards to watch everything for us, okay? If you ever come to my classes, I will tell you the number one item to buy for your RV is what we call an EMS, an energy management system, right? This is where it is monitoring the power coming from the pedestal. One of the things I tell my class whenever you come into class, you know, whatever you paid for your RV, this is the one time in your life where your house, you're moving it to different places and you're borrowing someone else's electricity. And if you're borrowing someone else's electricity, you're hoping they have it wired correctly, you're hoping the delivery is good. Well, one thing you do is put in what we call an EMS to actually watch everything for you. And if it doesn't like what it sees, it doesn't let the power in. So take that same concept that we have for the RV and put it into a battery. We call that a battery management system, circuitry, okay? We program logic into it. Lithium, you know, produces right up about 2.5 volts as a minimum uh, in its state all the way up to 3.65 volts. Well, what if I can put in logic that says, hey, anywhere we get close to discharging that battery too low, we open up a relay and don't let any discharge take place. Same thing. Well, when we go to charge it, okay, I don't want to overcharge that battery, cause it to swell and cause it to fail. So let's put in logic to actually stop the voltage from coming in or the power from coming in to over um, charge it. Amperage, right? That's the flow out. Same thing there, right? How much can we actually push out at once without causing the battery to go into thermal overload? So what we do is we just simply put in a lot of logic into these batteries. And the more we figure this stuff out, the more logic we can put in there. In early BMSs, they didn't have a lot of information in there. But I do want to cover some of the things. If you are looking at switching over, here's some of the things that you want in that logic board. Okay, so we already have on there the over voltage protection, under voltage protection, to protect that battery to last you 10 plus years. High temp protection and low temp. Temperature uh, and energy go hand in hand. Okay, temperature and energy go hand in hand. The hotter it is outside, the less effective any battery is. And all batteries, if you get them too cold, they simply won't work. There's still a chemical reaction. 
There's still a little bit of water in there, and if that water gets too cold and freezes up, that battery will not work correctly. Well, we figured that out with lithium. What if I can put in logic into that board along with the thermostat, right? It's reading the temperature of the battery and says, okay, it's too hot. I'm not gonna let any discharge take place or any charge come in. If it's too cold, I'm, not, I'm going to protect the battery, right? So again, we're just putting in that logic to keep that from happening. Balancing. Now, if you ever cracked open a lithium battery and I have that over there, you're just gonna see smaller cells inside, okay? It's just smaller cells. Think of a, a flashlight where you have to put in three D-size batteries in order to turn that light on. Well, this is kind of the same thing here with lithium. I don't know if you've ever had multiple batteries. For those of you with a motor coach, you got two plus batteries in there. Have you ever noticed that one battery fails before the other? Well, internal resistance. Now, in, I'll just say this, in, in uh, electrical theory, that shouldn't happen. They should be balanced and they should provide power evenly. They should be charged evenly. But little, little failures in each battery, what we call internal resistance. The more resistance, the less it's gonna run. In other words, the shorter lifespan. It's kind of like smoking, right? We all know that we have so many years, but if we smoke, then we knock off a few years. Kind of the same thing with, uh, I'm sorry, I just threw in smoking. I don't have no anything to do with that. And I apologize if I offended anyone, but that's kind of the risk you know, right? So same thing with that internal resistance. You got four different cells in there. And if one cell is just slightly more resistive than the other, then those cells will get out of balance. Again, what if we could put logic in there that kind of sees the balance and says, okay, this cell's completely full, but that one's not. What if we just move that power over there to fill up that other cell just to make sure they're all balanced, okay? Now, unbalanced cells isn't a big deal until you understand that whatever cell has the lowest amount of charge, that's all the power that can be delivered, right? So in other words, if you have a 100 amp hour battery with one low cell, you may only get about 80 amp hours out of it because that cell is too low. So having these things balanced so they could top off, you get the complete, potential power out of it. Well, it comes in two different states. And the, most of the lithium batteries that have been out there for the last 10 years, they had what's called passive balancing. In other words, we, I just simply call it a top-off charge. You have to be plugged in to shore power or you have to be plugged, you know, have solar panels up and not using the battery. The battery has to be completely charged in order for that balancing to take place. Passive balancing. In other words, the battery is not being used. Okay. Another one that we have is called active balancing. Now, active balancing will keep those cells balanced even while it's not being charged. And this right here is a huge game changer. Again, it's just new information. We're able to key that in and say, hey, we can still look at this, the, the state of charge between each cell. And if one has a higher state of charge than another, say within one-tenth of a volt, hey, let's charge it. Well, we do that with little capacitors. We just take little capacitors, put it on that circuit board and say, okay, charge that cell up over there so that way they're even, okay? If you're looking for a lithium battery, that's gonna be huge because, again, if you're gonna be off grid, that means you're not gonna be charging all the time. It doesn't make sense to get a battery that was designed for you to be off grid, but in order for it to be balanced, you have to be on the grid. It doesn't quite make sense, right? So. It's just information that we're able to key in into a logic board to monitor our systems, or monitor our battery. Self-heating, right? Again, if I said if the battery gets too cold, well, there's certain factors that won't work. And with lithium, the problem is, is if the battery gets too cold, it won't accept a good charge, right? It'll limit the charge. Now, almost all BMSs out there will have a low temperature cutoff. In other words, hey, it's too cold, I'm gonna open the relay. Well, what if you can add heat? In other words, hey, it's too cold. Why don't we take power from the cells and heat the cells up with the heating pad? Not too, indif or not too different than, of course, your heated uh, holding tanks, right? Go to somewhere, you got that water inside, it's too cold, you don't wanna freeze it, so you have heating pads, okay? So again, these are just the, the things that you need to look at when you're making a decision on switching over. Stow away. I know that a lot of us, we don't live the dream full time. In other words, we have to put that RV up for a while. And all batteries will leak a little bit of power. 
a lot of times we call it parasitic loads, right? No matter what you turn off in that RV, there's still things you can't turn off. The CO detector, uh, all of your appliance control systems, there's still power sitting right there. Well, lead acid batteries, we know they self-discharge. Roughly one volt every 30 days, it's not on a charger. You put your RV up for a couple months and they taught you just to use that battery disconnect, you come back a couple months later, it's still dead. That's just, that's the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Internal resistance in that lead acid battery, it's gonna leach off power over time. Lithium has far less internal resistance and so therefore it, it, it self-discharges at a much smaller rate, but there's still that parasitic load in the RV. What if you could just go over to a battery now with a convenient on-off switch, simply turn it off so there's no voltage at the terminals when you have it stowed away, right? So now you get two months out, you got a lithium battery, you just turn it back on, power's still there. It may not be 100%, but it's not dead. It may be at 90, 95% because of less internal resistance and I can turn off the parasitic loads at the battery just by simply hitting an off, on-off switch, which is kind of funny because of course, for 150 years, we haven't had an on-off switch on a battery. And you should see the number of questions I get. Hey, what's that button for? It's glowing. Well, that means it's on. Do I need to turn it off? No, that means it would be off, right? It's just something new for us to, to actually pick up on, okay? So again, what I'm really getting at is how do you see yourself RV, okay? If you really wanna know what type of battery, then I'll even get into how many batteries you need, right? You're taking your power with you, okay? I love RVing, I've been doing it for years now. Eh, resorts are okay, they're kind of fun, but there's still certain places like, you know, waking up, opening up your blinds to see the mountains. There's not a whole lot of RV parks out there, and those that are, are pretty much full all the time, okay? But if I can take the power with me, then I can enjoy that. So many other places I can go, for me, because of what I do. I don't get to travel for long times. I get basically long weekends, maybe one or two weeks. And so when we travel somewhere like here to, you know, from Texas to here, Colorado, we stayed over one night, you know, and just drove, I think 600, 500, 600 miles a day. Well, if you're taking an RV, that's kind of hard to plan where you're going to stop. You have to make your reservations and everything else. But if you can take your power with you, then you just decide when you're tired pull over, got a good spot to pull over, turn on your power, still have all your luxuries, right? And that's where having a battery that is strong enough to actually run your larger items, along with some help of some other components, right? Running down the road with the AC on inside the RV can be done with lithium batteries, not so much with the lead acid battery. So just giving you some uh, food for thought. I wanna stop here and then go ahead and answer any questions that you may have about the types of batteries, what we need to do to either service them or anything else. So I'm gonna open this up. For just a moment, if you've got a question, raise your hand. I'll have Mr. Vanna walk around with the mic to answer any questions. I know I answered everything and none of you have any questions. So great. Yes, sir. Are there any negatives to lithium besides the cost? Any, well, why would you even say lithium is a negative on the cost? They're expensive, right? Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the other. There's always considerations. And again, that's why I was pointing out the BMS, right? Um, batteries getting too cold. Uh, uh, so we just saw this year uh, for uh, individuals who had an, what we call an EV, an electric vehicle. So cold outside, they could not charge up. So they're sitting at a charging station and everything else. If they would have put heating pads in those cars to kind of keep those battery cells warm, they would not have had a problem on the charge, right? So being too cold is a consideration. Again, choosing the right battery that has not only the protection, but can also keep those warm, right? Um, Cost-wise, the one thing I want to point out, yes, these are more expensive initially, okay? The average cost of a 100 amp hour lead acid battery I just bought one last year for my daughter. She got a used RV and the individual thought that he could just, you know, use, he's got a little inverter in there running a refrigerator. He thought one battery can run that refrigerator for 11 days. No, he made it a day and a half, but this battery was dead. And as a technician, I tried all my tricks uh, that I could with a seven pin connector and everything else to get the landing gear up, I couldn't. So I had to go buy a lead acid battery. 
I went over to the local auto parts store, bought the smallest one I could find, right? Because I was like, I'm not going to use this after this. $230. I used to say an average lead acid battery is about 120, right? But since COVID, everything has went up, $230. Lithium batteries started off at $1,000 equivalent in same size batteries. Now they're down between 400 and 800 batteries, depending on all the technologies. So yes, you'll see, oh, these are two or three times as much. But an average lead acid battery lasts two to four years, or in cycles, three to 400 cycles. A lithium battery, between 5,000 and 10,000 cycles. So in the long run, if we looked at cost per watt, you're gonna pay half of the cost per watt on a lithium battery than you would a lead acid battery. So, I'm sorry, I addressed two questions there. Cost, yes, you have an immediate cost, but if they're guaranteed for 10 plus years, that's a longer warranty than you have in your RV, right? So it's gonna last longer than the RV in a lot of cases. But yes, again, those considerations, and that's why I'm pointing out the BMS. Too hot, too cold, you wanna make sure you choose the right BMS that not only will protect it from the cold, but also go ahead and self-heat it, okay? So other than that, relatively safe, um, actually safer uh, than lead acid when it comes to volatility. Yes, sir. Can you charge a lithium battery below zero? Well, yes, you can. Uh, if the temperature outside is below zero, but the battery is nice and warm because of its own heating. So with lithium, because we can charge it at such a high rate, okay? Now, lithium we can charge down to negative 20, but the problem is the speed at which we can charge it. If I can charge at 100 amps at 70 degrees, not a problem. 60 you know, degrees, 50 degrees, 30 degrees, there's no way I could charge it at 100 amps. It's too fast. So the rate of charge has to go down, right? Roughly to about five amps. So a kind of a slow trickle charge. But again, you choose a battery that has a heating pad, right? And it, it's got thermostats in there. It says, wait a minute, we're at 34 degrees. Let's go ahead and heat up, right? Then you can still charge at 100 amps. Um, how does the active balancing work if you have multiple batteries? Because then each battery is also going to discharge at a different rate. Correct. So it's like two batteries is like two large cells. Correct. How does that work? Yeah. So one of the things that we're learning, and now, um, again, I'm, I'm not only the trainer there, I train individuals to become solar installers. When lithium first came out, 100 amp hours, right? Oh, it's small, it's light, let's get these. And then you find out, okay, in order to run an air conditioner, you need at least three. And that 300 amp hour batteries will last that, uh, run that air conditioner for one hour. <coughs> well, dead gum, you're $3,000 in, they only run that air conditioner for one hour, so let's get six, let's get nine. Perfect question, right? Now you got nine batteries, right? Nine large cells, what is the potential difference between them all? The more batteries we have, the harder it is for us to stay balanced, okay? Active balancing keeps them pretty uh, close to one another. You only need the passive balancing to get those immediate. One of the things that we do over at Big Beard Battery, we don't offer a 100 amp hour battery because of the number of batteries you have to put in, the potential for balancing issues, right? So you want the capacity to be as big as possible so you can use as few batteries as possible, right? However, active balancing keeps it within one-tenth of a volt, all the cells, within one-tenth of the volt, okay? Regardless of the size, you know, and one of the things I teach, right, each battery has to hit that inverter, has to run the same exact race. It would be unfair for us to get on a track and you get to go 10 yards shorter than me, right? You're going to get there first, right? I'm going to get more tired uh, than you, and you're also going to get charged first, right? Because you've got a, a shorter distance. And it's the same thing with all these small little components that we add up. So. Um, well, the less batteries you have, the less balancing issues you have. So the bigger the capacity, um, uh, the less problems you have. But active balancing takes a lot of that out of the uh, picture because if I can get them all within one-tenth of a volt, if I have one battery sitting at, you know, 13.6 and one sitting at 13.2, I still have more than enough capacity in there to do what, a, you know, the, the variance wouldn't be that much. Could I get the full... 300 amp hours or whatever size, I maybe I can get 290. Okay, 
maybe not that big of a deal. I'd like to get a time where I can plug in or have good solid sun strike with my solar panels, not use the power, and let the top balance kind of finish that off. Passive balance only, a week is what it would take for you to be plugged in a shore power, right? Without, you know, any help. With active balancing, having them there an hour or two, because you're so much closer. More questions. So would you recommend in the winter to balance your batteries to top them off, balance them while you're not using your own? So. Well, here's the thing. I don't, you don't want those lithium batteries to sit there at 100% state of charge, okay? Um, the best thing to do is let them stay it halfway charged. So everything you know about lead acid batteries, you almost take the opposite, okay? Any battery you top off at 100%, you're going to have a greater potential to discharge, right? There's a lot of pressure sitting there, so it's going to discharge faster. So lithium batteries, whenever you're done for the season, Put it up at whatever state of charge it is, okay? It only discharges about 0.5% uh, over the course of months, okay? So whenever you turn it back on, what I would suggest is when you bring it back on, then plug it in. So before you leave, plug it into shore power or get some good sun strike for an hour or two. Get those topped off then, if you have the right battery. Okay.